morning, Shannon family. If you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, I invite you to open it with me to the book of James as we begin a new sermon series this morning entitled Practical Faith, the book of James chapter 1. As you're finding your place in God's Word, I want to thank you for just a wonderful service that we had last week as we were able to commission and dedicate 33 children unto the Lord. And last week you said, I will come alongside these families and partner with them. And so as the book of James tells us to put our money where our mouth is, I want to challenge you uh, right now on the screens, the QR code. We have a great need in kids' ministry. And so you can serve these families and the families of Shannon. If you are interested in serving in our kids' ministry, this is my appeal to you. You can uh, look at the QR code on the back or go to the lobby after the service as we would love to introduce you to what God is doing through Shandon Kids. All right, well, if you would look here at James chapter 1 this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, three commands needed for every trial. The Bible says here in James 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would speak to us today. Lord, we acknowledge that your Holy Spirit is the ultimate communicator. So, Lord, I pray that people would not hear from me today, but, Lord, in the area of trials and difficulties that your spirit would speak to us. Lord, we don't have to go through trials alone. You've given us your spirit, other believers, to comfort us. And so, Lord, I pray today that for the person who is struggling through that great trial, that difficulty, that time of challenge, that, Lord, you might comfort them today. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're beginning a series in the book of James, and I want to begin by asking the question, who is James and why is this book important to you and to me? James is the half-brother of Jesus. Now the Bible tells us there in John 7, 5, that early in Jesus' ministry, that the disciples or James, his brother, did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. I mean, how many of you have older brothers, and you ask yourself the question, what would it take for you to believe that your older brother is God? I'm sure that James, there was a degree of skepticism, maybe even jealousy, but there was something that he saw in Jesus' life. I mean, imagine that someone comes to you and says, by the way, your older brother is God, the one who snores beside you in the bunk, the one who keeps you up late at night, he is God. But there was something that happened after the resurrection that shifted James's mentality. We read that before that, Matthew 12, 46 through 50 tells us that Jesus was with his disciples. His mother and brothers were outside and they wanted to speak to Jesus. And Jesus said, these are not my brothers and my mother. You, my disciples, are my brothers and mother. And then Mark 3.21, the same account of that story, says that all of his brothers saw, thought that he was crazy, insane. But then something happened, 1 Corinthians 15, that great story on the resurrection, we learned that James became a believer there in Acts 1.14. As the early church was started, James was there. And Galatians 2.9 tells us that James was the pillar of the early church. He was the senior pastor of the church in Jerusalem. James became a believer. I believe that this is one of the reasons to believe in Jesus' claim as the Messiah. I mean, James's conversion is overwhelming to us because we see even his brother saw up close that Jesus is God. But we also ask the question, why is this book relevant to me, to my life? James is the New Testament version of Proverbs. 
James gives us bite-sized chunks of wisdom. James's focus is not on believing, instead it's on behaving. James is confrontational. It's in your face. It's up front. And James is going to tell us, don't just be a hearer of the word, but we're to be a doer of the word. One of the things that I find fascinating about the book of James, there are 108 verses, and yet there are 54 commands. That means that one out of every two verses, you find a command. And the very first command that James gives us is this, consider it all joy, great joy, pure joy when you go through various trials. That's what I want to speak to you on today, how we're to handle trials. This week, as I was writing on my laptop preparing for the message, I wrote in the word trials and autocorrect on the Word document, changed it to trails several times. And I thought that's interesting because trials are trails. Trials will bring us closer to God, that road to God or the road away from God. It's really our choice. And through five words as we begin this great book, we learn something about trials and difficulties. Look here at verse two. It says, whenever you experience various trials. So I want you to underline those words because in these five words, we see several truths about trials. First of all, that trials are inevitable. It says, whenever you experience various trials. It doesn't say if you experience trials. It says when you experience trials. You can no more avoid trials than you can avoid breathing. Trials are something that every Christian will go through. It doesn't matter how long that you've been a believer, how great your faith is, you will experience trials. Trials are not an elective course in God's curriculum. Instead, trials are a required course, and every believer must go through this class. You will go through trials. In fact, Jesus himself was a man of sorrow. Now, all of us would affirm today, if we are believers, that Jesus is the sinless Son of God. How many of us would say that God the Father didn't love the Son? None of us would say that. And yet, we know that Jesus went through trials. God had a son without sin, but he didn't have a son without sorrow. We even look at the New Testament writers, and we look at the Old Testament characters. I mean, think about Job. Job loved God, and he suffered greatly. Joseph, he was falsely accused, and he went through trials. Daniel he simply obeyed God and he was thrown into a lion's den. Paul, he was shipwrecked five times. As a believer, trials are inevitable. And you're looking at me today and you're thinking, Pastor, great way to start the message. This is so encouraging. Trials are inevitable. But not only are trials inevitable, trials are also unexpected. Look at this phrase. It says, whenever you experience I want you to underline that word experience. Some translations will say whenever you fall or whenever you go through various trials. I personally don't think that the CSB does a good job in the translation here with the word experience. I like the word fall better. Why is that? The Greek word is peripateo. It means to walk into or to fall into. This is the same word, fall or experience or go through, that is found there in Luke where we read about the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the story. The story of the parable of the Good Samaritan begins like this. There was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and as he went down the road, he fell into robbers and thieves. He was just going about his day, any other day, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the parable of the Good Samaritan, that man fell among thieves. In the same way, trials will come to you not expected. They don't call ahead. They don't knock on your front door. They walk through your door. You will go through trials, and those trials will be unexpected. One day you come home, and your spouse says that I'm leaving you. You didn't see it coming. Or perhaps you go to the doctor. You think that it's an everyday checkup routine, and yet the doctor says that you have a great condition and that cancer has six to nine months before you reach the terminal stage. It comes at you unexpected. Perhaps you think that your children are walking with the Lord only to get a phone call from the local county deputy. The Bible says that these trials come unexpectedly, 
But watch this. They also vary. That's another truth you need to see about trial. It says when you face or go through, experience various trials. That word various is the word variegated. It means multicolored. This is the same word that's used in Genesis 37 to describe Joseph's coat of many colors. So what he's saying here is you have trials that are of all shapes, sizes, and colors. It runs the full color spectrum. It uses the word trials in the plural, not a single, singular trial, but a trials in the plural. Whenever you go through various trials, now none of us like trials. If I were to ask you today, who wants to enroll in the course of trials, I doubt any of you would raise your hand. And yet the Bible says that the emotion that we are to take through the trial is one of joy. How many of you, when you go through trials, you ask this question? God, how long until you take me out of the despair? God, where were you in this moment? God, if you really love me, why am I going through this? Or perhaps we even say this, why is heaven so silent? I mean, it would be one thing if when we went through the trial and we prayed and we heard from God, but so often it seems like that God is silent and we're thinking, where is God in this? I want to direct your attention to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16. It's this story where David is just anointed as king. And did you know that there are seven years between verses 13 and 14? The Bible says that Samuel goes away. David's already been anointed. David could have walked into the palace, but instead, for seven years, there was silence. He could have gone on a book tour throughout all of Israel, but instead he went back to the sheep as a shepherd. And it seemed like God was silent for seven years. I mean, after all, David, the king of Israel, why would God allow David to go through something like this? And yet it was in those seven years that God was instilling courage in David's heart so that he could defeat Goliath. It was in those seven years where he was preparing him to write Psalm 23. What I'm saying to you today is if you're going through a trial and God seems silent, silence is not indifference, stillness is not inactivity, God sees you. And he says when we go through various trials. So there are three essentials, three commands that you're going to need for that next trial. That trial could be right now. You are going through the trial as I speak. This could be a trial that you step into tomorrow, and so you need this for the future. The first thing that James would tell us, the half-brother of Jesus, when you go through trials is that you need to come to the right perspective in your trial. Look at that word in verse 2. It says, consider. That word consider is a mathematical term. He's saying consider the pluses and the minuses. There are some minuses with trials, but there are also some pluses. He says come to the right perspective. You've got to view this from the right standpoint. You've got to view this from God's way. Trials have a way of drawing us closer to God. When Cassie and I were dating she was from Florida, and so I would go down and visit her and her family. And sometimes we would go to SeaWorld or Universal or Disney World. And uh, Cassie liked roller coasters, and so we would go on these roller coasters. But the really scary ones, here's what I noticed. She would lean a little bit closer to me on these uh, scary roller coasters. You know, in the same way when we go through fears in life, so often we'll do one or two things. We'll go closer to God or we'll move away from God. He said, consider this as pure joy. Now, let me be clear. No one in here wants to go through a trial. And the Bible is not saying that you should view the trial itself as joyful. None of us would want to go through a difficult time, a hardship, where our heart is gutted. No one wants to do that. But it's a matter of perspective, when you go through a trial, it's not based on what you feel, it's based on what you know. And what do you know? The Bible says in Romans 8, 28, that we know that God works together all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You've got to have the right perspective in your trial. Your trial may be hard today, and yet God's saying, I am wanting to work something in you and I'm going to work through you in this trial. You've got to have the right perspective. But not only the right perspective, you also have to see the right purpose, the correct purpose. 
Trials do not always produce good things in you. I think it was the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche who says that what doesn't kill you makes me stronger. Well, the problem is that he wasn't a believer, and not all trials that you go through will make you stronger. Some trials will make you weaker. Some trials will make you want to blame God. But he says you can't have that perspective. Instead, you've got to have a godly purpose. Now, we see the purpose of the trial in four words. I want you to underline four words with me in your Bible. The word testing, faith, produces, and endurance. These are the four load-bearing words of this purpose. That word testing means to push to the limit, to be pushed to the limit. That word faith means to trust in Jesus. Produces means to work out or carry out a test. And endurance means to stand up under. You put all of those together, and here's what James is saying. When your trust in Jesus Christ is pushed to the limit, God uses it to work out and strengthen your ability to stand under harsh situations. I don't believe that we as pastors have done a good job of preparing the church for trials, especially in the West in America. So often we think of this utopian society, but most of church history, we knew that the world was broken and, and full of, of difficult times. So often as we look at prosperity and poverty, did you know that God's truth advances much quicker in times of poverty than it does in times of prosperity. North America is one of two continents where Christianity is not rapidly growing at a pace unlike some of the other places in the world. Why is that? We've been blessed with prosperity. Now, prosperity is not a bad thing as we're talking about material prosperity. It's what we do with it. But here's what I want you to see today. A blessing is anything that brings you closer to God. Now, a blessing can be a trial if that trial brings you closer to God. You don't glory in the trial itself. You glory in what the trial does. So that's why James would say that consider it all joy when you go through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So endurance is a good thing, perseverance, to remain in steadfast. But the goal is not endurance itself. You can remain in a marriage and not be loving towards your spouse. You can remain at your job but not be proficient at your job or hardworking in your job. The goal itself is not to remain the goal is that through perseverance, you would be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Growing old is inevitable. Growing up is optional. I've met many folks who are older in age that they still haven't grown up spiritually. What he's saying here is that every trial is an opportunity for you to grow in godliness. Now, the Bible will tell us there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all who desire to live godly lives will be persecuted. Jesus said there in John 16, you will experience suffering. But it's through that trial, what will that trial do for you and through you? There's nothing that gets to you that hasn't first come through God. Now, that does not mean that God is the author of evil. James 1, 13 through 15 would say otherwise. But God allows things into your life, and if you will allow that trial to have its full effect and you turn to God, you will be mature and complete, lacking nothing. The goal is not happiness in the Christian life. The goal is godliness. Most people think, I want to be happy. Well, happiness is a byproduct of your circumstances, but joy is rooted in the Lord. Joy is something that no one can take away from you, no matter the trial, no matter the difficulty. So he says, when you go through trials, first you've got to have the right perspective, then you've got to have the correct purpose, but then you've got to offer consistent prayers in that trial. That's the third command or essential. Look here at verse 5. It says, now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. 
Now, someone's thinking, I've been praying for a long time, and God, well, God's not answering. Sometimes God says yes, and he says, help yourself to happiness. Other times God says no, and he says, I'm protecting you from something or someone. And other times God says, wait. That time of waiting is a difficult time. And sometimes we have a hard time making a distinction between the no's and the waits. And only time will tell if that no is a wait or the wait is a no. But here's one thing I want you to know from Revelation chapter 8. That all prayers that are according to God's will will eventually be answered. Now I didn't say that all prayers will be answered the way that you wanted them to. But all prayers that are in the direction of the will of God will be providentially answered according to his sovereign will. But we must continue to pray. Why? Because when we pray, we are trusting in God. I heard Tony Evans, he gave this illustration. He said that many Americans are aware, are aware of mutual funds. Many of you have mutual funds. Now, what is a mutual fund? It's when you take your assets and you divide them out among various companies so that if one company doesn't do well, that you still have a good portfolio. That's a good financial strategy, but that's a bad way to approach God. We must lean in to God with all that we have. It's not a mutual fund approach. It's that we go to God with all that we are, and we pray, and we seek him even in the trial. But he says, when you pray, you must not pray as a doubter. Several times, at least two times in this passage, it talks about praying in faith, not as a doubter. And it says that the doubter is like the person who is tossed to and from in the sea by the wind. You know, I thought about the difference between doubting and, and being a person of faith. You know that Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. But have you ever considered who is the author of doubt and how often doubt is brought up in the Bible? I was recently studying about Satan himself, his ways, his tactics. Did you know that there are only three times in Scripture where Satan is recorded as speaking? And in all three occasions where Satan is recorded as speaking, he uses the scheme of doubt. Say, what do you mean? Well, there in Genesis chapter 3, we know Adam and Eve in the garden, that Satan comes to them and says, has God actually said? I've often told you that so often Satan will put question marks where God has put periods. There in Genesis 3, Satan wanted Adam and Eve to doubt God's word. Let me take you over to the book of Job. Do you remember where uh, Job, he is tested that it says that Satan comes before God. We don't understand all the details of what's happen, happening there in Job 1. But Satan is trying to get Job to doubt God's goodness. And then we come over to Matthew chapter 4 there in the wilderness where Jesus is there in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan, he is recorded as speaking there and he wants Jesus to doubt God would provide for him. The only three times in Scripture where Satan is recorded as speaking, he is the author of doubt. Doubt does not come from God. Doubt comes from Satan. He wants you to doubt God's goodness, doubt God's promises, doubt God's trustworthiness. So that's James's point here when he uses the word in verse 8. He says, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. That word double-minded is the Greek word dipsychos. Die to psychos minded, two minded. The idea is that you come to church on Sunday and say, hey, I'm here to praise God and the rest of the week that you live for the world. You come on Sunday and you say, this is the week that I'm gonna give God my finances and start tithing and giving unto the Lord. And yet on Monday, you're looking for ways to cheat on your taxes and that you're not a good employer. Die psychos. That means that on Sunday you say, God, I am going to be faithful with my marriage vows, and yet on Monday you're looking for ways that you can unjustly try to leave your spouse. Die psychos, double-minded. James says that when we pray, we can't be like the doubter. We can't be like the person who is double-minded. Instead, that we have to trust that God's going to use this trial to work about his ultimate purpose. I was reading recently from Tim Keller, the late pastor 
who is now with the Lord. And he tells a story about Emily. I thought rather than to tell you the story of Emily, I might read her story. Because she was caught up in a situation that would be a trial, a dipsychos moment. Emily was a faithful spouse, and yet her husband left her. Let me read in her own words from a journal entry what Emily said. Emily said this. She said, if you had asked me what I was thankful for before September, I would have said that I am thankful for my family, my home, my job, and for God. For a husband who loves and cares for me, for four children ages 14, 11, 9, and 5 who were healthy and happy, for a home I never dreamed I could have, for a career that I love that allows me to work from home. And for a God that has provided me those things regardless of my worthiness. In September, completely out of the blue, my husband left me and our four children for someone else who left her husband and two children as well. This other family were friends of ours. We'd vacationed with them on three separate occasions. I thought she was my friend. My heart died within me. This could not be happening. My Christian husband, the one who had assured our kids that while divorce does happen, it would never happen to us. That we had made a covenant, a promise to God and to each other, no matter what, we will always be here for each other and for them. This was the man who was leaving. And I asked what he was going to tell the kids. And he said he didn't know. And I told him, you can't just leave without telling the kids something. Surely I thought this would hit him. And he would not be able to look at these precious children and tell them that he was leaving. But he did. He called them back downstairs from bed and told them he was leaving. And they didn't understand. Was this for work? When will he be back? No, kids, I'm moving out not to come back. He left. We were crushed. God, is this really your plan? How could this be your will for our lives? I know that you will heal my heart. I know that something good will come from this, but, but how? I've never been so angry. Our poor children are suffering terribly. Their father's wants come before their needs. He says, I still love my kids. Really? How can you love them and cause them such pain? The next journal entry. After four months, God is beginning to heal me in a way I'm not sure I wanted to be healed. I want to see justice, but it is not mine to inflict. I am beginning to try to pray for him and not just about him, for him to come back. Not to me, but back to God. I have to forgive him to get through the bitterness. But how am I going to make it? God says pray, so I do so. I'm praying for a miracle, for him to snap out of this and find his way back home. But I am also moving forward without him. And then the final journal entry. It has now been six months. My situation has gotten worse, and yet I feel truly blessed. My husband is still gone, still with his girlfriend. He told me that they will be a part of our kids' lives, and I need to get used to that and not hate her. He told me that if she is my enemy, then I am his. My kids are still dealing with the impact that their dad left. They are depressed, angry, confused, and frustrated. My oldest has started questioning his faith. He is rebelling against all authority and lashing out at his family. My house is up for sale, a short sale, which could turn into foreclosure. And yet, in the midst of all of this, I have come to know God on a different level, to see him work in a way I'd only heard about, to experience this is quite amazing. I've never really had a big tragedy in my life, never really had to fully rely on God. I mean, sure, I prayed and saw God work, but not like this. Before, when I needed God's comfort, the image in my head was me clinging to Jesus and him hugging me. My image now is me completely collapsed and him carrying me 
and it is awesome. In the midst of this horrible situation, I see glimpses of what God is doing and how my life and our lives will be changed. And I get so excited to see who I get to be at the end of all this. Like being in a race where it starts to rain and you hit a mud pit. You can't go around it. You have to go through it. And the rain and the mud are weighing you down. And you can't go through it fast. You must concentrate on each painful step. But at the same time, something is keeping you upright and compelling you to continue. In the distance, you see what appears to be a sheet of rain, almost like a car wash rinse. And then you see it, the sun. It is perfectly clear. The person you will be there will be stronger and filled with peace. I can't wait to use what God has taught me. I've explained it to my children like this. In every fairy tale, there is always a tragedy. And the protagonist faces that adversity, overcomes it, and thrives because of it. God is giving us our fairy tale. Can you see him there at the end? As I heard about Emily's story, I began to think that is what James is telling us. I mean, trials are inevitable. Trials are unexpected. She didn't think that her husband, or they had four children together, was going to leave her for the person that they would vacation with. And it was multicolored. And yet... Because she applied James 1 of not only seeing the perspective from God's perspective, seeing the purpose, and then offering consistent prayers, she could say that God is healing me. Now for you today, it may not be a spouse that has walked out on you. It could be a medical diagnosis. It could be that you've lost your job. It could be wayward kids, but the trial is just as real. And what God would say through James, the half-brother of Jesus, is you don't have to rejoice in the trial per se. You rejoice in what the trial produces in you. You come at this from God's perspective and say, God, heal me. God, help me. God, as I'm growing old, inevitably, help me to grow up spiritually and you lean on God, not a mutual fund approach, but you're all in on Jesus. And he will heal you. Here in just a moment that we are going to pray. But before we do that, there may be someone here that you've never received Jesus as Savior and acknowledged him as Lord. You can't go through trials without first having the power of Jesus within you. And so the invitation to you today, my appeal today, is for you to come to Christ and be saved. If you don't know what that looks like, Step forward during the invitation. One of our pastors and leaders is here to talk to you. We also want to pray with you because in a room this size, there are some of you who you are carrying a trial that is so heavy and burdensome. And yet Jesus would say that my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Jesus would say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. The Bible says in the 59, one another's in scriptures, that we're to bear one another's burdens, to pray for one another. So if you're going through a trial of some kind, I don't know what that trial looks like, but would you come and let us pray with you today? I imagine that it may be an elongated time of response because there are trials, heavy trials in this room. And yet as I was reading Emily's story, I just feel compelled. I didn't do this in the first service, by the way, but I, I sensed that the Holy Spirit was saying, Daniel, call for the person who is being unfaithful to their spouse and call them to repentance. That could be you today. But there is forgiveness at the cross. And if that is you today, would you have the courage to during this time of invitation just step forward and say, Pastor or whoever you meet with, I need help as I've been unfaithful. And we as a church want to walk alongside you there is hope in the gospel. There is restoration in the gospel. Perhaps you are the one that has been the perpetrator like Emily's perpetrator. And yet God wants more than anything else for you to come to him. There's no one who's too far from God. No one who's, who God's grace cannot touch. And God would say to me, I truly believe that God is speaking to hearts in this moment. 
So here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. We're going to respond. Maybe you need to come for salvation. Maybe you need to come for prayer in a trial, a wayward child, a medical diagnosis, a hurt in your life. That you're estranged from a family member or a relationship. We're here to pray for you. Or if there is some sin that you must lay down at the altar, the Bible says, confess our sin to one another. We want to walk with you. But God's Spirit is speaking right now. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And God speaks by His Spirit and through His Word. So I'm going to pray, we're going to respond, and we're going to see God do work in this moment. Lord, we pray right now for the person who is burdened with that trial, whatever it may be, the loss of income, the cancer, failure, the strained relationship. Lord, would you minister your grace in this moment as we pray with one another. Lord, for the person, Lord, who is walking in sin, Lord, I pray that they wouldn't hold on to that sin. You are much greater than any sin, and there is forgiveness. There is hope in you. Our identity is in you. So, Lord, that person, would you give them courage to step out? If it's been years long that they've been holding on to uh, an affair, Lord, and that they've just kept it in, Lord, I pray that you would bring about freedom in this moment. Lord, for that person, Lord, who needs to be saved, that they don't know how to experience true joy, Lord, would you work among us. So, Lord, let there be freedom in this place, the ability to respond to you. We want more than anything else your presence. So, Lord, work among us, we pray in Jesus' name.